In the last week's lecture, we uh, introduced some concepts of encryption. So encryption is taking plain text and a key, and we apply an algorithm that transforms that plain text into ciphertext based upon the key. Uh, the idea is that the ciphertext, if someone intercepts a ciphertext and sees it, they cannot get the plain text unless they have the co correct key. Okay, so the algorithm must be such that given the ciphertext and the algorithm, it must be hard to find the key or the plain text. And we had a couple of examples of old ciphers, the Caesar cipher, I think. But uh, that was just to illustrate some concepts. And we started to talk about attacks and keys. And we'll get back to that to today, uh, different types of brute force attacks. But from the attacker's perspective, their goal is to find the plain text or the key. Okay? So they have the cipher text. They have the algorithm or the cipher. So we assume the attacker knows the algorithm being used. They want to find the plain text, what was encrypted, and the key, because the key should be secret. Now, in some uh, attacks against systems, the attacker may know more. They may know other pairs of plain text and cipher text. Maybe they've discovered it through other means, and that can help them for some algorithms. There are two basic approaches for the attacker. Brute force attack, where you are trying to find the key of the plain text. Then there are a limited set of keys, so try them all. And one of them that you try, if you try them all, will be the correct key and will give you the plain text that was uh, encrypted. The other approach is to a little bit more intelligent cryptanalysis where we try to take advantage of the characteristics of the algorithm, some weaknesses perhaps, or uh, yeah, some weaknesses in the algorithm and try and work out what the plain text or key is. So analyze the algorithm to try and derive the plain text or key without having to try all possible keys. Brute force attack is, is simple but time consuming. That is, it, it, if you have many keys, it takes a long time to try them all. Cryptanalysis is hard, but if you can find a weakness in the algorithm, then it can be much more effective than a brute force attack. We mentioned a little bit about brute force attacks or the number of keys last week. We'll see that again. But let's, before we go through more uh, issues of attacks, let's go in more depth about symmetric key encryption. So in symmetric key encryption, the model is that we take plain text, denoted as P, we encrypt using a key. And in symmetric key encryption, the key is known by both the encryptor and the decryptor. So we say it's a shared secret key. The key must be secret. No one else can know it apart from those people encrypting and decrypting. And it's shared. That is, both user A and user B have the same value. So there's symmetry between the two users with respect to the keys. That's why we call it symmetric key encryption. It's the same key on both sides. And the algorithm must be such that we encrypt with the plain text with this key K. We get ciphertext C. We send the ciphertext to the user B. And the algorithm must be such that when we decrypt using the same key, we must get the original plain text back. If we don't, then it's ineffective. And the attacker's objective is to take the ciphertext, assuming they know the algorithms used for encryption and decryption, to take the ciphertext and find the plain text or the key. So they don't know the key and they need to find it. This is the most commonly uh, used form of encryption for, uh, well, still is, for, for all types of data encryption. There's another form which is called asymmetric key encryption, where the keys used on either side are different. So the, there's asymmetry between the keys. We'll see that later in this topic, not today though. This is the main form used. The other one's used in, in some special purposes. We'll care, compare them after we go through the second. For this to work, or to be secure, 
it must be hard for the attacker to be able to find the plain text or key. Impossible, preferably, but in practice impossible is not possible. That is, making an, an algorithm such that it's impossible in, in theory to find the plain text or key is very hard or very inconvenient. So usually there's ways to measure the strength of the algorithm. Think about how much effort it would take an attacker to find the, the plain text or key. And again, this one uses shared secret keys. Sender and receiver must both have a shared secret key. How do they get it? How does each user know the value of k? Let's say user A on the, on the left chooses the secret key k. Chooses a 128-bit number randomly. I use my computer to generate it. How do I get it to user B? We write it down and when we visit them we give it to them on a piece of paper. But we that's a manual delivery of the key. Right? It's possible, not very convenient, of course, especially if someone's on the other side of the world. So but be careful, we assume that there is some way to distribute the key to the, the receiver B. So so far we assume that A and B know some shared secret. And no one else knows it. Otherwise, it's not a secret. So we may see at the end of this topic there are some ways to automatically distribute that key to B in a secure manner. Of course, we can't just send them the key in an email or via some message over the network because if we send the key and it's unencrypted, then the attacker could intercept and see the key and therefore it's no longer secret. And we cannot encrypt the key, at least using this technique, because to encrypt the key we need another key to encrypt. And B must know that key. And we have this same problem. So for now, let's assume that they somehow have exchanged keys. Later we'll see a, a technique that we can use to automatically do it. And again, secret key means no one else knows it. With, within symmetric key encryption, there are maybe two types, block ciphers and stream ciphers. And they really differ, differ well, in terms of definition about how much plain text they encrypt at a time. All the algorithms in use today, we have some input plain text. What they all do is that they break that plain text into chunks, different fix, usually fixed size sequences of bits. So with computers today we operate on plain text and treat it as uh, bits. So the difference between block ciphers and stream ciphers is on how many bits or bytes do they operate on at a time. So what normally happens is that if we have a large file, two megabytes in length, for example, we want to encrypt it, what the algorithm does is takes that file and splits it into blocks. In a block cipher, the typical size of each block is 64 or 128 bits. Okay, different algorithms use different size blocks. In a stream cipher, the algorithm usually encrypts one byte or in some cases one bit at a time. So eight bits or one bit. So really the difference is how many bits do they operate on at a time. So if we're using a block cipher, we have a large file, we break it into, say, 64-bit blocks, we encrypt each block at a time. Get some ciphertext as output, encrypt the next block, and so on. Well, it's a similar in the stream cipher, but we encrypt one byte at a time. Now, what the, the practical difference is, is that the stream ciphers that have been developed are generally much faster in terms of implementation of block ciphers. Much faster in that uh, you take the, your input plain text and to encrypt it happens in less time. Okay. So uh, when we care about encrypting something in real time then stream ciphers usually make sense. For example, 
or two different cases, I have a file on my disk, a large file. I want to encrypt it, so I apply an algorithm that encrypts it. Usually we'd use a block cipher. The time it takes to encrypt is not so important. Whether it takes one second or two seconds probably doesn't matter for me. Okay, or even one minute if it's a very large file. All right, I'd like it to be fast, but uh, I can put up with a, a little bit of delay. So block ciphers are mainly used for file encryption. Stream ciphers were really developed for uh, real-time streaming of data. For example, you're talking uh, to someone across a network using voice over IP or some application that's streaming data in real time. As you generate that data, as you talk, your computer con converts your voice to bits and those bits have to be sent straight away so that the receiver receives them within a short delay. And there maybe a stream cipher makes sense because those bits which are generated are encrypted quickly and then can be sent. So it introduces a much smaller delay than block ciphers. So stream cipher is mainly applied for streaming data across a network. We want to do things quick. So there's some differences in the algorithms between the two. But in fact nowadays, because computers are so fast and the algorithms have been uh, improved, the block ciphers are quite fast as well. In some cases, almost the same speed as stream ciphers. We will list some examples of block ciphers and you'll see them mainly in use, but we'll also mention some stream ciphers. Stream ciphers usually make use of an exclusive OR with a random number. But those details we will not get into. So just be aware some people talk about block and stream ciphers to classify them. Let's look at some block ciphers. And the main one that was really became popular, designed in the sort of the, the late or the, the mid-1970s was the data encryption standard. It was designed by IBM and the NSA had some input and it was standardized eventually by what's called NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the US. And it became popular because uh, it was made standard in by the US government and that meant really that many of the US government departments when they encrypted data and hence many of the companies that needed to deal with the US government had to use this standard. And it spread across the world and, and probably uh, is, was one of the most widely used encryption ciphers in the world. And in fact many of the ciphers that have been uh, built since then have similar concepts to DES, the data encryption standard. And what DES would do is, when we have our plain text input, it would take that and split it into blocks. And the block size was 64 bits. So what it would do is the, the algorithm itself just encrypts 64 bits at a time. So if you have a file, it splits it into 64-bit blocks and encrypts that and gets ciphertext out. And the resulting ciphertext, one simple way is just combine the ciphertext from each of those blocks. So you take the first 64 bits of your file, encrypt, you get 64 bits of ciphertext. You take the next 64 bits of the file, encrypt, and get 64 bits of ciphertext. You keep going, and the resulting encrypted file is that combination of all those 64 bits of ciphertext. There are, in fact, other ways to combine those output blocks, but we may see that later. But DES is designed to take 64 bits in of plain text, 64 bits out of ciphertext. And it uses a key of, the key was actually 64 bits in length, but in effect 8 bits were un, unused for encryption, so effectively it's 56 bits in length. And we're not going to go through the design. If you want to know the design, you need to sit through my security and cryptography course for three or four lectures. But uh, that's not what we'll go through today. Um, what the design looks like is this. Okay, so it's the, the algorithm specifies uh, 
how do you transform the plain text to get ciphertext? This is just to illustrate that there are many components to the algorithm. Uh, it's too small to see, but the red rectangle at the top takes 64 bits of plain text in, and down the bottom here produces 64 bits of ciphertext. And then the way that the cipher works, and many ciphers today, block ciphers, is that they use two common operations, substitution and transposition. And we tried to illustrate them last week with the Caesar cipher. Replace one letter with another letter. That's substitution. And the other cipher we used, I think, was the rail fence cipher. We wrote the, the letters in, in rows. That's transposition, where we rearrange letters. So even though we went through simple ciphers, DES uses the same concepts, but on binary values. It combines operations of substitutions and transpositions. Transpositions is rearranging. Another word for that is a permutation. So a permutation is an arrangement of a set of elements. So the other thing that DES does, and many ciphers, is that it uses simple operations of transpositions and substitutions, and then it repeats those operations and repeats them again and again and again to make the output ciphertext more secure. And again, this is too much detail for this course, but the idea is that in this red rectangle, there's a round, round one, which is this big green rectangle here where we do some operations of permutations and substitutions and we get something out. Then round two, we just repeat that but taking as an input the output of round one. And we repeat it again and again and again with the idea that applying these operations multiple times makes this, it harder for the attacker to take the ciphertext and work back to the plain text. So DES used 16 rounds of applying some complex operations. Uses exclusive ORs, left shifts and, and so on. It's quite complex to go through, but many people consider the design to be quite secure. Okay, so people have analyzed and try and find weaknesses in the design of this algorithm, and most people consider it to be quite secure. That is, if you get ciphertext as output, it's very hard to work backwards and find the plaintext, unless you know the key. The problem with DES is that the key was too small. 56 bits, at the time, maybe in the 1970s, computers could not uh, try all the possible keys in a reasonable time. To try all possible keys, you have 56 bits in each key, so there are 2 to the power of 56 possible keys. How many is that? Well, it's 2 to the power of 50. 2 to the power of 30 is a billion, 2 to the power of 40 is a thousand billion, so 2 to the power of 50 must be close to a million billion. So 1 followed by 15 zeros. Well, in the 1970s that was considered too many keys for a computer to try within a reasonable time. But as computers got faster, it turned out that it started to become possible to build a computer that would be able to try all possible keys. And if you can try all possible keys, you'll eventually find the correct key if you're the attacker, and you'll be able to decrypt. So DES became subject to a brute force attack. So from that perspective, it was insecure. But from the perspective of the algorithm, it was considered secure. It's no longer recommended because the key is too, too short. We'll see examples of good length keys shortly. But people, when they realized that DES was maybe not so good anymore, they started to design new ciphers. 
And one of them was triple des. Basically use des, but use it three times, using different keys each time. So apply a des operation and, and do it three times. And either use three keys. So if, if one key is 56 bits, then three keys triples that to 168 bits. And a brute force attack on 168 bits is much, much harder. Not possible. The problem with triple des is that it was three times slower than des. And the time when des was designed, it wasn't designed for speed and for the current computer architectures that it was built for. And today's, it's, it's quite slow. So again, triple des is available today and considered secure, but not so common because it's quite slow. And sh soon we'll, I'll show some examples on a computer how long it does take to encrypt. So we'll put some numbers to slow. And sort of in the 1990s, the, the US government tried to develop a new standard for encryption. There were others around, but uh, one of them that because uh, the US government creates a standard that everyone within the US must use, it becomes widespread. So they created the advanced encryption standard, AES. And they actually had a competition where many people from across the world submitted their algorithms and they, people compared them to select the best algorithm and eventually AES was created. It used similar concepts to DES. It uses multiple rounds, multiple operations of substitutions and permutations. It operated on a block size of 128 bits. So if you've got your one megabyte file, that's split into blocks of 128 bits and encrypted one at a time. It allowed for different size keys. So if you were happy with a 128-bit key, you could use that. But if you were really wanted to be secure, you could choose a longer key. And the trade-off was really performance. The longer the key, the slower to encrypt. So it su supported three different key lengths, generally. AES is widely used today. Okay, so in terms of encrypting data, there are other algorithms, but one of the most widely implemented ones is AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard. If you use full disk encryption on your computer, on your laptop, your operating system encrypts the, the contents or file encryption, usually they use AES. Wi-Fi encryption makes use of AES. Uh, many uh, protocols used for communications across the internet use AES. So this is a widely used in encryption standard. The purpose of this course is not to go through how they work. It's just at this stage to mention some of them so you're aware of when you hear of AES, you know it's a block cipher. There are many others. This just lists some names of different algorithms that people have designed over the different years. They all have similarities in design in that they use either 64 or 128-bit blocks. They have different key sizes. And this Feistel structure was this common design structure that people used for DES and, and continued for other algorithms. No need to know about all of them, but uh, just some examples. So, for this course, we're not going to study the details of the algorithms. What we're going to assume is that when we want to provide IT security, that there are some symmetric key algorithms that are secure and that we can use and trust. AES is one and there are others. And really, the key point that know about symmetric key encryption is captured in these assumptions. And in fact, these assumptions and some others are in, in one of the handouts. So they're on the slides, but there's also a handout uh, a little bit later uh, that lists them all in just two pages. I'll just bring it up so you're aware of that. You'll find it somewhere in your handouts. This, there's a two-page uh, 
list of assumptions and principles that we're going to arrive at at the end of this topic on cryptography and then we're going to use them as we go through the subsequent topics in this course. So when we talk about passwords, uh, encryption in the internet, denial of service attacks, we'll always come back to these assumptions so that we can uh, make some arguments of what's secure and what's not. So have that one ready when we go through the next topics. So what are they to get started? So symmetric key encryption. We use the same secret key K used for encryption and we denote that as the function E usually and decryption, the function D. And often that secret key which is shared between the two users A and B will write as K subscript AB. If it's shared between users D and C then K subscript DC, just indicating A knows the key and B knows the key. So that's the notation. We encrypt plain text P with a key and that produces ciphertext. So uh, using our notation apply our encryption function. The input is a key shared between A and B and the plain text and the output is ciphertext C. When we decrypt that ciphertext, if we use the correct key, then we assume that it will produce the original plain text. So we have some algorithm, E, such that it will always produce the correct or the original plain text. And that the decryptor, the person who does the decryption, will be able to recognize that plain text is correct. And therefore the key is correct. So we write the decryption as we take the ciphertext as input, we take the same key that was used for encryption, KAB, and we apply our decryption algorithm and we get the plain text. We assume that if we try to decrypt the ciphertext using the incorrect key, that we will not produce the original plain text. We'll produce something different. And more importantly, we'll be able to recognize that what's produced is not the correct plain text. And therefore recognize that the key we've used is wrong. So let's say A and B have a shared secret key KAB. A encrypts using KAB and they get the ciphertext C. And then another user comes along, user X. They know the ciphertext C if they try to decrypt that ciphertext using a key other than KAB, so some other value, then when they decrypt, they will get the wrong plain text. And in fact, we'll assume they'll get some uh, random sort of garbage plain text that they'll be able to recognize this is not the correct plain text. So that's this point. The decryptor, if they use the wrong key, the one that wasn't used for encryption, they will not get the correct plain text and they will know that. So there are assumptions that we'll use as we, as we go through and, and apply the concepts of cryptography to build up security mechanisms. Questions on those assumptions? Again, later make sure you know where to look them up so we can be clear on how they're used in different um, security mechanisms. What is E and D? What are the algorithms? Well, for example, AES implements the encryption or decryption algorithm. DES, triple DES and many of the others. That's what we mean by E and D in this case. What is KAB? Well, with AES, it's a 128-bit or a 192 or 256-bit random number, usually. So when I talk about a key now, we talk about binary values, some length, and usually when we choose a key, we choose a random value. Okay? I don't choose a key of all zeros, because then it's, if I choose the key according to some structure, then it's more likely that an attacker can guess that key. 
in the same way that you never choose passwords from words. You always choose random passwords, correct? No? All right. Passwords are different. But in theory, with passwords, you should choose a random sequence of characters. It's harder for someone to guess. Well, same here. We choose a random sequence of bits. It's harder for someone to guess. Now, in theory, passwords, if we choose random ones, is good, but not very convenient for us. But with keys, it's not us really choosing it, it's the computer. So a piece of software chooses the key, and it's easy to choose and easy to remember because it's usually saved on disk. So we usually use random keys for block ciphers and stream ciphers. We'll come to passwords in our next topics. So, given these assumptions, what about the attacker? Well, we've said there are two types of attacks. Brute force or cryptanalysis. Try all keys or try to find some weaknesses in the algorithm. Try all keys in the key space. The key space is the set of all possible keys. So if I have a k-bit key, then the key space is 2 to the power of k keys. That's all possible values. And a brute force attack, we usually measure how good it is, or, or measure the attack based upon how long it takes. And the time it takes to try all keys depends on two main factors. How many keys we need to try. 2 to the power of k, if we have a k-bit key, and how fast our computer is. Okay, so if I try 1 billion keys using my laptop versus 1 billion keys using some supercomputer, they'll take two different amounts of time. But usually when we talk about the strength of algorithms, we, we don't look at the time, in fact, we look at how many operations that it takes, how many decryptions we need to uh, apply, or really how many keys. So we usually approximate and say, OK, uh, this algorithm, the strength of it, depends upon how many operations we need to do to defeat it, to break it. With a brute force attack, that's purely dependent upon the, the key length. So we usually ignore the fact that different computers take different amounts of time and just assume that they're all the same. We'll see examples of the different speeds on different computers shortly. With cryptanalysis, we need to find weaknesses in the algorithms. And that depends upon the specific algorithms. There are different methods and different analysis techniques that people take advantage of, meet in the middle attacks and, and different names of attacks which we will not go through. But generally with well-designed algorithms uh, they are hard to find attacks that will defeat them. And the algorithms in use today there are some known attacks but in theory they're not much better than brute force. So therefore they're not very practical. When we looked at crypt cryptanalysis, an attack, we measure the, the strength of an attack and therefore the strength of an algorithm based upon how many operations it takes to defeat the algorithm, how many decryptions it takes, for example, the amount of memory we need to defeat the algorithm. The more memory we need, the, the stronger the algorithm. And maybe the amount of known information by the attacker the more information the attacker knows based upon previous plaintext and ciphertext, the easier it is for the attacker. We'll see some of the numbers of them shortly as well. On brute force attacks, this gives some, puts some numbers to the time given different theoretical computer speeds. So the first column is the key length. You can ignore the last row here. Maybe for this course it's not relevant. I use it in, in a different example in my other course. But ignore the last row for here. So the first column, those first six rows, indicates the key length. For example, if we use DES, a 56-bit key, the key space in the second column means how many possible keys. And quite simple, 56-bit key, 
2 to the power of 56 possible keys. The normal version of AES, 128-bit key, 2 to the power of 128 possible keys. The last three columns say if we have a computer that can try keys at a particular speed, how long would it take? So we give three different examples of computers. For example, if we can calculate at one billion or try one billion keys per second, 10 to the power of 9 is one billion. If we have a computer that can do that speed, with deaths, it would take 833 days to try all possible keys. That's easy to calculate. If there's 2 to the power of 56 possible keys, and we do 10 to the power of 9 keys tried per second, and then we just divide and we get the number of seconds. We can try that. I don't know if my calculator will handle it. Actually, I'd I do. Again, I'll bring up my trustworthy BC calculator. 2 to the power of 56. That's the number of keys. How many is it? That's how many. Okay. And if we can do 1 billion keys per second, 10 to the power of 9 keys per second, then that's how many seconds it would take us to try them all. Well, seconds, what can we do? Convert to minutes, divide by 60. Convert to hours. Convert to days. 833 days. Okay, so that's the calculation of the time. Sorry if it doesn't uh, show very well there. We'll move that across. Uh, sorry, well, the projector's not aligned. A bit easier to see. 833 days. So that's all. That's the, the key space divided by the, the rate. And that's this one. If we had a faster computer, 1,000 times faster, or we have 1,000 computers. Okay, we distribute this task across many computers. And that's easy to do because with a brute force attack, what we do is we try all keys, and we don't have to try them in any particular order. We can try some keys on one computer and another set of the keys on a different computer at the same time. So we can make it a uh, we can parallelize this problem quite easily. So the second column says if we could do in total 10 to the power of 12 keys per second, then our 56-bit key would be down to 20 hours. Okay, so, well, that's reasonable. But if we have that processing. And the next column is what if we could do 10 to the power of 15 per second? Well, down to seconds. So 56-bit key and even 64-bit keys are considered too weak for encryption today. How fast is your computer? Which column do you think it's near? Anyone have a guess? A laptop or a new PC today? We'll see. It depends a bit on the algorithm, but they're closer to the... They're less than 10 to the power of 9. Okay. So they're nowhere near here, so I'll see shortly in my laptop it's, I think, one million per second, not one billion, or, or tens of millions per second. So, say, a standard laptop is not going to break deaths on its own. But if we buy some dedicated hardware that's programmed to break deaths, and we, we spend a bit more money than just on a, a normal CPU, then we can do it, especially if we're a company or a government. So these 56, 64-bit keys are considered too short to be secure. The, the smallest length for AES is 128 bits. Even with 10 to the power of 15 keys per second, it would take you 10 to the power of 16 years to break it. 
So that's considered long enough. Okay. And similar, increasing to 256, 10 to the power of 54 years. Just as a note, the age of the universe is 10 to the power of 10 years. So we're not going to do it before the universe ends. There's an error somewhere there. I think uh, this 5 seconds is wrong. You'll work out the exact value. It's not 5 seconds. I think it's 5 something else. Other time unit. I haven't fixed that. Brute force is easy to, de to, defi is easy to prevent by just making the key long enough. Okay? Generally 100 bits or longer. Uh, nowadays people use 128, even 256 is commonly used. Most algorithms are slower with longer keys. So that's the trade-off. More secure, but slower to encrypt. We'll go through how fast by looking at an encryption on my computer. That is, I'll use some software to encrypt something very simple and we'll get then some measure of just on my laptop, which is a few years old now, how fast it takes in practice. And you can do the same in maybe in, in later uh, some homework tasks. So I'll use some software to encrypt some message and then we'll measure the speed and see how long it takes to encrypt. This, the commands I'm going to use are in one of the handouts there or they're linked to on the website so you can see them and run them uh, on your own. Some of your homework tasks will involve doing something similar to this. The software we're going to use to encrypt is called OpenSSL. And it's widely used not just as we're going to use it, but it's used by other software. So many uh, web servers, many applications use OpenSSL to encrypt data. Now in the last few months there have been some flaws found in it, a serious flaw that uh, meant that people using it uh, were revealing their keys to other people or some secret information. But still it's considered, well, it's still one of the most widely used encryption libraries available. Uh, we're just going to use it because it's easily available and uh, it's something you can try on your own computer. So first I need some plain text and I'm going to copy some of the commands to save a bit of time. You'll know what they mean. So I'm just going to create a file called plaintext.txt and it was going to contain some text. Okay, the, the plain text is our message here and okay, it creates the file uh, just to be sure. Okay, there's our message, our plain text. We want to communicate to someone. We're going to encrypt it just to be get some details. The number of characters in this, 72 characters. How many bytes? Anyone want to guess? How many bytes? Is this file or is this plain text? Normally a computer will encode bytes. Normally a computer will encode uh, text characters as a byte each. Okay? One character, one byte. 72 bytes. Okay. That's the standard encoding. And we can check. It's 72 bytes. Okay. How many blocks if we use, say, DES? Remember our ciphers, our block ciphers, take the plain text and split it into blocks. How many blocks are we going to have to encrypt here? Two, four, uh, this is 72 bytes. How many blocks? 11, 12, 2, 4, I'll say when you get it correct. Des, look back at des, des. Nine sounds okay. Des, if we just jump back. Des operates on a block size of 64 bits. 
8 bytes per block. Okay, so DES encrypts 8 bytes, produces 8 bytes of ciphertext, then applies the algorithm on the next 8 bytes of plain text. A AES works on 128 bits. I'm going to encrypt with DES just, just to get started. So with 72 bytes, DES does 8 bytes at a time, so there'll be 9 blocks in this plain text. We will not see it, but what DES will do is just take the first block, encrypt it using its algorithm, take the next block, encrypt with the algorithm, and combine those output blocks together. Before we encrypt, maybe we, can, we should look at the plain text. We said it's 72 bytes. XXD is just a, a program to look at, at a file but in binary or hexadecimal form. DES and other ciphers, they all operate on bits, not on letters. It doesn't matter the language. They just treat everything as a sequence of bits. First, that's the, the file in hexadecimal. Okay, H, we have 4.8 in hexadecimal. Okay, not so important at this stage. Let's look at it in binary. Uh, let me remember. You don't need to know these commands at this stage. There's the file, but in binary form. So the first column just says where we are in the line of the, the, the output. So it's these four columns is the binary form of this file. So the first letter H in hello, uppercase H, is represented by these eight bits. And you can work that out in that, remember, if you go back to ASCII encoding, you can look up ASCII encoding and find the letter uppercase H maps to, what's this, 72, I think, in ASCII. Okay, so that's, that's all. This is just ASCII encoding of these characters to binary. So what DES is going to do is take, what have we got, uh, 64 bits at a time. So here we have 32 bits and another 32 bits. DES encrypts those 64 bits and gets some ciphertext. Then it does for the next 64 bits and gets some more ciphertext. And at the end, it just joins those blocks of 64 bits together. And that gives us our result. Let's, we need to encrypt. And we have our plain text to encrypt. What else do we need? A key. Anyone want to choose a key? Well, we should choose a random key. Okay. We, we should let our computer choose a random key for us. So we need some way to choose a random number. Different ways to do it on, on my computer. This program, OpenSSL, actually has a random number generator. Uh, I'll generate it in hex. There's a random number and another random number. And it's how long in hex? Eight bytes, 64 bits. DES actually takes a 64-bit key as input, although we said it's 56 bits. Of those 64 bits, only 56 are used, but we must generate a 64-bit key so our 8-byte key, and I'll use the first one, this 5, 7, and a 3, 3. The way the algorithms work when we have more than one block is that we join them together. And the simple way to join the ciphertext blocks together is just to concatenate them. But there are other algorithms to join them together. And in fact, in practice, most algorithms take a, a third parameter. So we have plain text, a key, and a third parameter that really initializes the algorithm to for joining, joining the ciphertext blocks together. We'll not explain too much about it, but it's often called an initialization vector, something to initialize our algorithm. And I'm going to use this second random number for that. Don't worry too much about that yet. So we've got 
plain text. I've got a key, this 5, 7 value, and I'll also use this EE e value as some other initialization vector. And again, you don't need to remember this. I'll just copy it. OpenSSL will use to encrypt. Encrypt. We'll choose an algorithm. It supports many different algorithms. DES is the algorithm. And the way that we combine the blocks together, we must specify. And this, we're using a, the basic technique called uh, ECB, Electronic Code Book. Again, not so important for you. Not yet. What's minus E mean? I can't remember. But we may see later. Take my input, plain text. Produce some output, ciphertext. Okay, so if, uh, we're going to use software called OpenSSL, encrypt using the algorithm DES. Inputs my plain text. The output's going to be a file called ciphertext.bin. Uh, and I need to specify the key and this initialization vector. Minus IV, I'll just copy and paste these values. And the key, minus K. And another option, sometimes the software will add some padding in there to allow when we decrypt to detect if it's correct or not. But I don't want to do that. It's of no use. So I need to add a special option, no padding, no pad. It's just a, a, a feature for this software, not so important. We encrypt. It's encrypted. We now have ciphertext.bin. The length is 72 bytes. Okay? If we encrypt plain text, we always get ciphertext of the same length, unless maybe we introduce some padding in there. But we haven't done that. Let's look at the ciphertext. First, we'll look at it in hexadecimal. There it is. Okay, so the ASCII encoding and the actual hexadecimal values, we could look at it in binary. It shouldn't make any sense. The idea of encryption is to take some structured plain text, which makes sense, and convert it into something that appears random, such that when someone has that random ciphertext, they have no way to work out what the pattern of the plain text was. And if you look at these sequence of hexadecimal characters, you shouldn't see any pattern in there. Anyone see any pattern? Sure, okay, we need to be secure. Okay, make sure I haven't done anything wrong. So the idea of encryption is to convert structured plain text into random ciphertext. That is random, no pattern in the output ciphertext. Look at these hexadecimal characters. Any pattern? Hard to tell, isn't it? Look close. There is. You can either look in the ASCII form, but the dots are those unprintable characters. Okay. In the ASCII. Or maybe in the hexadecimal form. There, in fact, Look at the fourth row and the seventh row. They are the same. Okay, that's a problem. And that's a weakness in this encryption. When we have ciphertext which has a pattern, it's very unlikely randomly to ch choose uh, to generate uh, this number of characters that are identical then it gives an opportunity for an attacker to try and deduce what the plain text was. And in fact, there's a weakness in how we encrypted this such that the output ciphertext does have a pattern. And it's to do with the way that those blocks were combined. Okay, we encrypted 64 bits at a time, really two rows. Actually, no, uh, one row in hexadecimal. 
This is, we encrypted and produced one block of ciphertext, another block of ciphertext, and we produced nine blocks of ciphertext, 72 bytes. It turns out in this case, the fourth block is the same as the seventh block. Why? Well, let's look at our plain text and you may see why. Why is the fourth block in the ciphertext the same as the seventh block in the ciphertext? Because the fourth block in the plain text is the same as the seventh block in the plain text. Okay, in, in uh, our original message it was space, secret space. Just turned out that our message was uh, if we broke it into blocks that we ended up with two blocks which were the same. And that the way that the algorithm works is that we encrypt a block, we get ciphertext. We encrypt a block, we get ciphertext. So therefore, if we encrypt two blocks which are the same, we'll get the same ciphertext output. And that's a problem. And the problem can be overcome, we will not do it here, but it can be overcome by combining the output blocks in a different manner. In our case, we just concatenated the output blocks together. But there are other algorithms called modes of operation that will combine them in different ways. In the command that I used, the way that I combined it I just was called ECB. That's the, the basic way to combine the blocks. There are better ways. This one's insecure, but it's a very simple one. So that's just an aside that you need to not just choose the algorithm to encrypt, but the algorithm to combine the blocks together after you encrypt. And there are some that are better than others. What else can we say about this? Let's decrypt just to make sure it works. I have my ciphertext. I'll link decrypt, open SSL, N, E, N, C, same algorithm, DES, ECB, but specify the minus D option. The minus E option was for encrypt, the minus D is for decrypt, I remember now. The input is the ciphertext. The output, let's call it something else, maybe the received message. That is, this is what the receiver does. The sender, user A, takes the message, encrypts sends the ciphertext across the network. Then user B receives the ciphertext and they must de decrypt. So we decrypt and we're going to get some output. And we need to use the same values for our initialization vector. Let's hope I can find them. And the key. So we must have them at the receiver and notepad, I think. And let's just look at the received file. Okay, it worked. That's good, our algorithm works. Of course, when we decrypt, we must get the exact same plain text, which we have in this case. But let's, that's not so interesting, let's decrypt Again, I know it's a bit hard to see, but let's just change one thing. Let's change the key. We encrypted with key that ended with 3 3. Let's change that to 3 4 when we decrypt. What's going to happen? Cannot decrypt? Well, we will be able to decrypt, but what, what's the output going to be? So what I've done, I'm going to decrypt, the minus D means decrypt, our ciphertext. I'm going to write it to the file called receive2.txt. IV is the same as before. The key is almost the same as before, except this last number, 4, 
when we encrypted it was three. Now I've changed to decrypt with four. So I'm using a different key to decrypt. What's going to happen? Maybe the ends of the last bits of each block will be different. Okay, we've got the different key here. So I think you know that you're not going to get the right, the same plain text if we use this different key. Let's do it and have a look. So we do that, and I'll open the the, the file with our trustworthy XXD. Receive two. There it is. And it's, it's hard to see, but this is the, the received plain text in this case after decrypting. It's random, eff effectively. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. The dots here mean that they are unprintable ASCII characters. We cannot display them like control characters. Uh, so we didn't just get some bits changed. We effectively get all bits changed. One small change in the key means nothing works. We decrypt and we get plain text which is really random with respect to our original plain text. And that's what we'll assume that always the case if we use the wrong key, no matter how close to the original key, what we'll get when we decrypt will be recognizably wrong. I recognize this is not the message someone sent to me because no one sends me random messages. Sending people random messages communicates no information. So this decryption failed. And we know that because the message makes no sense. And most secure algorithms have that property. Change just one thing in the key or change one part of the ciphertext and you decrypt and you'll get random output. Recognizably wrong. Questions on encrypting and decrypting? You don't need to remember all this code. Not yet, anyway. So what's insecure about this approach that we just did? We should be able to recognize maybe two things which were wrong or insecure. We use DES with ECB, electronic code book. What's wrong with DES? Uh, what's wrong with DES the out, the in general? No. The key is too small. Okay, with DES, all right, the key, it's hard to see here, but this is an 8 byte. If we convert it, it's 8 bytes or 50, 64 bits. But in fact, only 56 are used. So if you go back to our brute force, we can buy hardware that will break that within a short amount of time. So someone can guess my key or calculate my key by just trying decrypting many times, just change the key until they get output that makes sense. It has some English words, and then they've found my key. That's the problem with DES. The other problem, and we haven't touched upon it much and we won't have time to, when we use block ciphers, the way we combine the blocks is important. In this approach, we just concatenated them. That's what ECB does. And the result was, if I bring back one of the earlier ones, when we have blocks which are the same in the plain text, like the fourth one was secret and the seventh one was secret, when we encrypt, we get identical blo blocks in the output. So the fourth one is this Q9, W9, and the seventh is the same, exactly the same. That's the problem in the way that we combine blocks. The algorithm ECB is a problem. There are other better ones that we should have used. We're not going to touch upon those algorithms anymore. We won't have time, but if we just jump forward, where are they? They're described here. How to use block ciphers on large pieces of data. There are things called modes of operation. One's called electronic code book. It's not secure. 
It's very simple but not secure. There are others which are considered secure in different situations, CBC, CFB and, and others. But there are a few pictures on the next few slides, but we will not cover them. But in a homework, you may need to choose one. So just be aware that you choose not just DES or the encryption algorithm, you also choose a mode of operation. But usually there are some default ones which are automatically chosen or I'll recommend one to choose which is secure. Okay, let's, in the last 15 minutes, some other practical things. How fast can I decrypt? Well, OpenSSL has a, a speed test built in. And what it does, it just does a few uh, decryptions and it tells us how long. So what we're going to try is see how fast my computer will decrypt or encrypt using AES with a 128-bit key and using the, the mode of operation called CBC which is a common uh, combination. And what it does for three seconds, it does as many as it can of different size blocks. So 16 byte blocks, 64 byte blocks and so on. And at the end it will give us some summary statistics. Uh, maybe I should zoom out so it's a bit easier. Sorry. It wraps around. I'll do it again. And we'll just take one of these as an example. It's just doing as many as possible on my computer and uh, take this number first. There's some small differences between them, but this says that my computer can encrypt using AES 61 megabytes per second. Okay. So to, if you have a large amount of data, if you have a 61 megabyte file, 61,000K, it can encrypt that within one second. So that's some measure of speed of how much data can we encrypt per second. So if you have a, a large multi-gigabyte file, then it will take uh, multiple seconds if we use AES. The other way to look at it is how many encryptions per second. And it doesn't come out so well, but maybe this number. What is that? 11 million. 11 million, really, encryptions in three seconds. They did it for three seconds, and it counted. I could do an 11 million in three seconds, so in one second, that's about, what, a little bit less than four million. So my computer can do about four million operations per second. So if I was going to try a brute force attack on a key, you can think that my computer can try about 4 million keys per second. There's some variation. So it can encrypt or decrypt, and they take about the same time, encrypt and decrypt, at a, a speed of about 4 million times per second. 4 million, 4 by 10 to the power of 6. Remember back to here? Well, this was a calculation for 10 to the power of 9. So my computer is about a thousand times slower than this column. Sorry. Which means if I tried to brute force deaths, it wouldn't take 833 days or what's that, nearly three years. It would take 300 years on my laptop. But if I had a better computer, it would be faster. And in fact, if I had a access to hundreds of computers, I could speed that up by a factor of hundreds because we can parallelize. Let's look at other examples. My computer is not designed or the CPU is not designed in, or the software is not designed to be fast for encryption. There's actually a mode that we can do that takes advantage of the hardware to enable it, I think, EVP. Nowadays, CPUs have a special instruction in the instruction set to AES encrypt. So there's some hardware optimizations. So I'm doing the same. What's this? 
uh, or here. Before I had, what, 68 or 61 megabytes per second. Now it's up to 366 megabytes per second. So your CPU nowadays, in the last few years, includes an instruction to encrypt with AES, AES only. So they're designed to be faster in hardware. And another example. Some people have, of course, to defeat ciphers, they build some dedicated hardware. Not a general purpose CPU, but build hardware that's just for decrypting. I may have included this in your handouts, maybe, I can't remember. No? Maybe. A long way through, okay. Yep, it's there. But it's just an example of, of some hardware people have developed over the years to try and defeat different ciphers. So back in 1998, uh, first people to start to design si uh, hardware to defeat DES. Okay, so in 1998, EFF developed some hardware. It cost less than 250,000 US dollars. All right, sounds expensive to us, but for, say for an organization or a government, that's not very expensive. And it could do 80 billion keys per second on deaths. Okay, my computer did something like 4 million keys per second on AES. At that time, this is a long time ago, this could do 80 billion keys per second. So it was hardware dedicated for decryption of deaths. And it could solve deaths, so ba basically brute force deaths in uh, a couple of days. So that meant at that time deaths was insecure. It could be uh, broken by brute force. But what about a AES, which is widely used today? In 2006, uh, some company, SciEngines, developed some hardware to try and brute force AES. Okay. So they used FPGAs, so dedicated hardware just for operating on AES. And they use a bunch of them. So they had something like 128, 120 FPGAs of these boards here, single boards. They implemented them. And they could do something like 400 million keys per second per FPGA. So times that by 120 for the entire system. Actually, this one, sorry, was on DES. The next one's AS. So they broke DES in eight days, but it only cost $10,000. So $10,000 is not much for, for most people who want to try and decrypt DES. So DES was truly broken at that speed, at that time and quite cheap to break. If we try and extend that, and we'll come back to that, Moore's Law, what's Moore's Law? Moore's Law was uh, this idea that computers get faster every, every year or two. That is, the, the number of transistors we can fit on there gets more and more. Roughly, it says that computers double in speed every one and a half years. It's not exact, but let's assume that today I buy a computer for 30,000 baht, and in one and a half years' time, for the same amount of money, I can buy a computer which is twice as fast as today. That's what it says. Okay? Or the other way, Today I buy a computer for 30,000 baht and it's at some speed. In one and a half years, I spend half as much money and I can buy the same speed computer. Okay. The cost halves every one and a half years for the same speed. Given that approximation, then today, or this was 2013, I haven't updated in the last 18 months, it's quite easy to break desks. Hundreds of dollars to buy hardware to break desks. What about AES? The same company, SciEngines, built dedicated hardware to break AES. A brute force could
could do about 500 million keys per second. on this one piece of hardware. It cost about $100 per FPGA and this piece of hardware used 128 FPGAs, field programmable gate arrays. Uh, so there's some other statist statistics there, about half a billion keys per second. Remember our first column of our table was a billion keys, so this is about half the speed. Uh, just get to the, the main point there. How long does it take if they can do that speed to break AES? Look at this column. AES, 2 to the power of 128 keys. That's a key space. They can do about 64 billion keys per second per $15,000. So the, the hardware costs about $15,000 and you can do 64 billion keys per second. If we extrapolate that, then to break AES, for $15,000, it will take us 10 to the power of 20 years. Okay? But if we spend more money, we can buy more of these machines. So if we spend $15 million, we increase the capacity by a factor of 1,000. Therefore, we decrease the speed by a factor of 1,000, 10 to the 17 years. If we spend $15 billion, than 10 to the power of 14 years. So even a government who wants to spend $15 billion just to break AES is still going to take uh, forever to do it. So this is just illustrating, even with the most dedicated hardware, AES-128 is still secure against brute force. Remember, computers get faster and faster and faster. So what about if I use AES-128 today? What about in 15 years' time? Can someone break it then? Well, if you extrapolate again using Moore's law, you see if you spend $15 billion in 15 years from now, 2028, it will cut you down to just 100 billion years to break it. So again, it's still <laughs> secure. All right? If you don't use 128-bit keys, but in, you're a little bit paranoid and you want to use 256-bit keys, then it's going to take, again, 10 to the power of 49 years to break. So AES is considered secure against brute force attacks. So that's just something about the speed of computers in practice and the brute force attacks, if we just make the key long enough, we can defeat them. We can't uh, be subject to a brute force attack. And that almost finishes. So that's, that was some examples of how fast we can do it today. There are other crypto, crypt analysis attacks on these ciphers. So brute force is one way, the dumb way. Crypt analysis is to look at the algorithm and try and find a better way. And people have come up with some better ways. Focusing on AES, just to give an idea, brute force attack on AES, you need to try 10, 2 to the power of 128 keys. There's an attack in theory that can cut that down to 2 to the power of 126 keys. So if you measure and compare the, the attacks against brute force, 2 to the power of 126 compared to 2 to the power of 128 is about four times faster. So instead of, what do we have, uh, 100 billion years, it would be four times faster, maybe 2 billion years. So cutting it down by a factor of four means nothing. It's still secure. And in fact, these attacks, you can see details in these uh, references, but the attacks in theory, can be a little bit faster, but in fact they require extra information to work. They require either extra memory, a large amount of RAM, or known data passed upon past encryptions, past plain text ciphertext pairs, which are impractical in most cases. So today AES is considered secure against brute force and secure against any publicly known 
crypt an, cryptanalysis. And many people still use it. To finish today, we assume that the at attacker knows all algorithms that are in use. They know that we're using AES and they know the implementation details of AES. We assume the attacker knows everything about the algorithms. They know any parameters in that algorithm which are public. We assume the attacker can intercept any message sent across the network. Anything sent across the network, let's assume the attacker can find it. But we assume the attacker doesn't know a secret value. If we say this is a secret value of the algorithm, then let's assume the attacker has no way to know it some other, through some other means, like a secret key. And let's assume from now on that brute force attacks are impossible if we use a reasonable size key. Reasonable size may be more than 80 bits. So AES-128, let's assume brute force is not possible. So later when we talk about using these techniques to provide security mechanisms, you can't just say, oh, let's brute force it because it will take you forever to do it. So we'll use these assumptions as we go through the rest of the course. Next lecture tomorrow, we'll start from here. We'll look at not encryption but authentication of data, proving who's, who you're communicating with.